So just to start with a little bit of a question, how much of our hearts, how much of our desires, our hearts, does God want? Is he satisfied with us just yielding just a little bit of our lives to him? Or does he expect all of it? Jesus says in uh, Luke 14, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Does that sound easy? It's not, that doesn't that sound very easy. Now, what he's saying there isn't literally hate people. It's compared to God, we need to love him first. Well, how about the next verse? Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That means physically giving up your life. Like Jesus carried a cross to where he was going to die. We need to be willing to do that for the Lord. Is that easy? Of course, the honest answer is no. It isn't easy. But it is what Jesus expects his followers to do. He expects us to give our total devotion to him all of our lives. And he knows it's not easy. And he doesn't candy coat it, but he tells us very plainly. Now Jesus does promise that for his people, he will give us a changed heart, changed desires, so that we will want to do what pleases him. And he also gives us the strength to also live the way he wants us to live. He says that we do need to follow him and that he is the Lord. Well, today we're going to see, along with King Amaziah, that God has power to help or to cast down in our lives. He can help us. He can be there. And Jesus meant what he says when he says, you need to follow me. But he's also with us in the daily struggle to do that. Now, you might ask, well, who's Amaziah? Well, we're going to back up the genealogy a little bit. Let's back up to David. So David, of course, was the second king of Israel, but he was the best one. Out of all of them, he is the one that everyone else is compared to. He was the best. And Solomon, his son, came after him. He started off pretty well and didn't end so hot. Rehoboam was started off pretty well, didn't do so well, but then kind of came back and did better. Abijah was after him. He was good. Azza, after him, was good. Jehoshaphat was good. Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, was not good. Ahaziah, his son, was also bad. Athaliah came after that. She was a usurper. She was actually the wife of Jehoram. Uh, When Ahaziah died, she killed off all the royal family and decided she would reign. But God kept Joash alive, and he started reigning as a king at seven years old. He started off really well, but he ended badly too. Now, Amaziah is Joash's son. He starts off okay. He doesn't end off so hot either. So from last week, we actually saw Joash start to reign, like I said, at seven years old after Grandma Athaliah got taken out. Um, And he did well. He did very well under his advisor, uh, the priest whose name was Jehoiada. But when that priest died, Joash abandoned God totally. Some of Joash's servants conspired against him and killed him after he was wounded by the Syrians who had come and invaded. And then his son Amaziah became the king. And that's who we're looking at today. Chapter 25, 1 and 2. Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, yet not with a whole heart. Now that's why I started the way I did, not with a whole heart. Again, how much of our hearts does God want? Is he satisfied with us yielding just a little bit of our lives? Well, Amaziah's heart is going to come out in due time as we go along here. Like I said, he starts reasonably well, but he ends pretty badly. Now, we saw this pattern in some kings already, like King Joash. And the pattern is going to continue as we carry on through Chronicles and will actually get worse. But he did start off obeying the law of Moses. Verse 3. And as soon as the royal power was firmly his, he killed his servants who had struck down the king his father. But he did not put their children to death according to what was written in the law in the book of Moses where the Lord commanded, Fathers shall not die because of their children, nor children die because of their fathers, but each one shall die for his own sin. So this is good what he did actually. 
Um, Amaziah is acting like a just judge in his duty as a king, and he brings justice on murderers, people who actually murdered his father. He's following God's laws opposed to what the culture that day would have him to do. Generally, they would just kill off the whole family, but he doesn't do that. He was, he's obedient to God's law at this point. Yet later, interestingly, he's going to totally ignore one of the most important commands about uh, who actually you worship. Well, the next thing he does is he prepares for war. In verse 5, Then Amaziah assembled the men of Judah and set them by fathers' houses under commanders of thousands and of hundreds for all, for all Judah and Benjamin. He mustered, mustered those 20 years old and upward and found that they were 300,000 choice men fit for war, able to handle shield and spear. Or spear and shield. Unfortunately, at that point in time, that period, basically, war was a yearly event generally in those days. And for their security, they often had to, if they weren't attacked, they often had to go and attack people who would attack them otherwise. And so that's what they were getting ready to do. Well, he also hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God came to him and said, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, with these Ephraimites. But go, act, be strong for the battle. Why should you suppose that God will cast you down before your enemy? For, the God, for God has power to help or to cast down. Now that little phrase right at the end there, that's our main idea. For God has power to help or to cast down. And we're going to see how this plays out both in, in Amaziah's life in both ways. God helps him and he will also cast him down. And he can do that for a lot of situations. Now Amaziah is worried that his own army is not really strong enough, so he hires help from his neighbor Israel. But of course, he's warned against that by a prophet. Now why? What's the big deal there? Well, it's because Israel had totally put aside following God, and basically God would not help Amaziah if he had those guys along. The prophet said that if you have the Lord, you'd basically you just don't need anything else. You don't need extras. For God has power to help or to cast down. So like Amaziah, do we worry that we don't have enough strength for different things in our lives? Strength, for instance, to resist temptation. Do you worry that you don't have enough strength just to serve God the way that you would like to do that? Well, the answer is the same. God has power to help or cast down. What God calls you to do, he equips you to do. Any one of us, as a believer, he equips us to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. That may be extra things like children's ministry, Bible teaching, like some people do. Or, like all of us should be doing, he equips us to develop a relationship with our neighbors so we can talk to them about Jesus or whatever else. For myself, being a pastor, believe me, was the last thing on my mind eight years ago. But God made it pretty clear to me that he was calling both me and Denise, to do something different, even though it was way out of our comfort zone. God has been faithful to help us do what he needs to do. A verse I found really helpful uh, for that, Romans uh, 12.3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned Basically, every follower of Jesus, every one of us, is an individual. God knows that. And he gifts us uniquely. He says a measure of faith that God has assigned. He's given to us um, uniquely. But he does that so that we all have a role together in the church as a group, as a body, as the body of Christ. Verse uh, 6 in Romans 12 says, Having gifts, the Holy Spirit gives us having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And when you look at the gifts the Holy Spirit gives, they are always gifts that are used to serve others, to serve the church. And that's why we need each other. Even though he gives us as individuals, he also gifts us to serve each other. But the important thing is, God wants us to, to use whatever he has given us. Wherever God puts us each in life, he wants us to be there and to do whatever it is, and that he will be there to help us. For God has power to save, to, sorry, to help, or to cast down. 
Now Amaziah wonders what he should do about the money that he already gave out to Israel. Verse 9, And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do about the hundred talents that I've given to the army of Israel? The man of God answered, The Lord is able to give you much more than this. Now he's worried about the loss of money. Now, if you're wondering how much money that actually is, um, a talent is 75 pounds. So 100 talents is 7,500 pounds of silver. Well, for 100,000 people, that may not go all that far, but still, you don't want to really lose that. That is quite a pile of money. But the prophet put things in proper perspective. God can take care of it. Just obey him. And again... For some people, when they look at becoming a follower of Jesus, they, always, they sometimes think about, what am I going to lose? And you may have thought that, you know, am I going to lose money? I can't get the job. I, won't, I can't live my life for money, for instance. Or I might lose fun. I might lose public opinion. People will look down on me. Whatever we think to lose by following Jesus, he can and does more than make up for it, whatever it happens to be. For God has power to help or to cast down. So he initially obeys the prophet. We move on to verse 10 there. Then Amaziah discharged the army that had come to him from Ephraim to go home again. And they became very angry with Judah and returned home in fierce anger. Verse 11. But Amaziah took courage and led out his people and went to the Valley of Salt and struck down 10,000 men of Seir. The men of Judah captured another 10,000 alive and took them to the top of a rock and threw them down from the top of the rock and they were all dashed to pieces. Now there's a little map here. Amaziah goes against Seir, which is Edom. Right on the bottom is where Edom, where Edom lived. They lived just south of where Israel is in the Valley of Salt. They've actually been a number of battles there. If, we, if you remember back in Chronicles, uh, David fought the Edomites there and there was a battle with the Edomites not that long ago either in the, uh, as far as chapters and Chronicles goes. And that's where they were. And he defeats them. And if these, the Edomites were basically perpetual enemies. Uh, if they didn't attack them, they were going to come and, and invade them at some point. Now, we wouldn't find their methods acceptable today, but for that period of time, that's kind of what they did. They either took you as slaves or they killed you off. Well, this time they chose to kill off the people. But either way, God did help Amaziah. He helped him and he helped Amaziah, but he cast down Edom, exactly as he said. God has power to help or to cast down. Now, we're also told, though, that the army that Amaziah sent home, the people from Israel, were not too happy. Verse 13. But the men of the army whom Amaziah sent back, not letting them go with him to battle, raided the cities of Judah from Samaria to Beth Horon and struck down 3,000 people in them and took much spoil. Boy, talk about spoil sports. But it shows you the mindset of the day. They were insulted and they were taking revenge. And we'll be back to this event here in a little bit, but just keep it in the back of your mind. So it's just kind of thrown in there, that verse, but uh, there is, it's there for a good reason. Now, you would think after God gave that kind of victory to Amaziah that he would follow God more. He saw how God helped. But unfortunately, our hearts can be very deceptive, and he obeys his own desires Amaziah is lured by what's attractive, but, but, but by what is ungodly and what is untrue. Verse 14. After Amaziah came from striking down the Edomites, he brought the gods of the men of Seir and set them up as his gods and worshipped them, making offerings to them. Therefore, understandably, the Lord was angry with Amaziah and sent him a prophet who said to him, why have you sought the gods of a people who did not deliver their own people from your hand? But as he was speaking, the king said to him, Have we made you a royal counselor? Stop. Why should you be struck down? So the prophet stopped. But he said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. Now that's pretty crazy, really, when you think about it. I mean, why would the king do that? Well, we really aren't told. But there must have been something about the worship of the gods of Edom that was attractive to him in some way. And anything that tries to lead us away from following God is attractive to us. Anything. All sorts of things that, 
um, will lead us away from following God are usually attractive in some way or another. And the king was obviously set in what he was doing. He didn't want to hear anything otherwise from this uh, prophet. Now, the prophet's reasoning was pretty sound. I mean, if you just think about it, I mean, the, these gods didn't help the Edomites. Why in the world are you taking them on? Well, in addition, God's word obviously uh, strictly prohibits worshiping any other kind of God except for the true God, for, for God. And Amaziah would know that, but he was rejecting that. But sin of any kind appeals to people strongly and can be attractive in many ways, pulling us to it. Jesus said in, in, in uh, John 8, 34, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And sin is simply living in a way contrary to what God has commanded us to. And there is power in sin to, in sin to enslave humans. But Jesus came to, fee, to free his people from sin's power. He came to free us from the penalty first, but also from the power of sin. And eventually, we will be freed from the presence of sin when we are in his presence. But when Jesus died on the cross, he was firstly paying for the penalty of our sins with his own death. Because the penalty for, from God for our sin is death. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he also defeated death, breaking the power of sin and death, of death and sin. And with, and with Jesus paying the penalty on our behalf for our sin, we can be forgiven by God when we confess our sin to him and trust in Jesus' death and resurrection to forgive us. Now, Romans 6 talks about how when, Jesus, when we believe in Jesus, when we trust him, God accounts the death and resurrection of Jesus like it was actually us who were there who died and were raised from the dead to newness of life. Romans 6, 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. With Jesus paying the penalty for our sin, that was taken care of, and the power in our sin of sin is also broken in our lives. Look at that again. Consider yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ. That means we can live a life of real righteousness, a life that really pleases God. Uh, verse 12 of Romans 6 as well that says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to, to make you obey its passions. Don't let it be what rules you. Verse 13, Do not present the, your members, in other words, the parts of your body, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members uh, to God as instruments for righteousness. In every way, our bodies can now be used to live a life pleasing to the Lord rather than in slavery to sin. We actually have a choice. Now, often we feel trapped in our sin. But that's, that is a lie um, that we feel like we can't change. But that is just simply not true because God has the power to help or to cast down. It's a matter of who we submit our lives to. Do we go our own way or do we follow the Lord? We can go to the Lord for help because God has for us has broken that power of sin through Jesus. Now Amaziah had chosen to go his own way, worshiping gods, rejecting the Lord, and now he figures he's pretty great stuff because he beat Edom and he stole their gods. So he also now wants to get back at Israel for what its soldiers did as they went home when they were raiding Judah on their way home. So he challenges the king of Israel to war in the next section here. And we will find that in doing that, the king is cast down. Verse 17. Then Amaziah, king of Judah, took counsel and sent to Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. Now, you might be a little confused at this point with that name Joash, because last week we looked at another Joash, and he was another Joash. That was Joash of Israel, Amaziah's father. This is Joash of Israel. Same name, different guy. That's why the writer put in the, all these son of, son of, son of, etc. So you would be able to keep him straight. So this is the king of Israel, also by the name of Joash. So he says, come, let us look one another in the face. That's a challenge to him. I want to see you, buddy. And Joash, the king of Israel, sent word to Amaziah, king of Judah. 
a thistle in Lebanon sent to his cedar in Lebanon, saying, Give your daughter to my son for a wife. And a wild beast of Lebanon passed by and trampled down the thistle. You say, See, I have struck down Edom, and your heart has lifted you up in boastfulness. But now, stay at home. Why should you provoke trouble so that you fall, you and Judah, with you? Now, King Joash is pretty spot on with his assessment of Amaziah's challenge being from pride. Now, he very insultantly has this little story, compares uh, Amaziah to a little thistle and himself to a big cedar. And King Joash is not looking for a fight. He's trying to warn Amaziah of the foolishness that war with him would be. But, verse 20, Amaziah would not listen, for it was of God, in order that he might give them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought the gods of Edom. Remember, God has power to help or to cast down. First, God helped Amaziah because he was obedient. He relied on God. But now, Amaziah's foolishness in worshipping Edom's gods, God will cast him down. God is in charge of history, and in his sovereignty, he brings about his purposes in his timing. In this case, it will be to judge Amaziah and the nation of Judah for their sin. Verse 21. So Joash king of Israel went up, and he and Amaziah king of Judah faced one another in battle at Beth Shemesh, which belongs to Judah. By the way, that's about 15 miles to the west of Jerusalem, Beth Shemesh. And Judah was defeated by Israel, and every man fled to his home. And Joash king of Israel captured Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Joash, son of Amaziah, at Beth Shemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem for 400 cubits, from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate. And he seized all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of God in the care of Obed-Edom. He seized also the treasuries of the king's house, and also hostages, and he returned to Samaria. Well, that is a pretty thorough thrashing from King Joash of Israel. God cast him down like he said he would. Now, if you think about it, Joash, king of Israel, is actually pretty lenient in a way because he could have killed Amaziah. He didn't. He actually let him live, although he uh, inflicted a lot of damage on the country. Verse 25. Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived 15 years after the death of Joash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. Now, the rest of the deeds of Amaziah from first to last, are they not written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel? From the time when he turned away from the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, that's uh, south and west of Jerusalem. But they sent after him to Lachish and put him to death there. And they brought him upon horses, and he was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Yet another king killed by conspiracy of his own people because he abandoned the Lord. And also yet another king who seems to start well, but obviously did not finish well. Now, King Amaziah, in spite of all those things, he's a warning to us, but he's also an encouragement to us. He's a warning for some good reasons. Number one, be wary about the attractive, appealing nature of sin. It looks exciting and fun, but it doesn't deliver on its promises, and it only ends in death. That's one warning we can take from his life. The other is, is that there is no hope for any of us to resist sin in our own strength. We can't do it. On our own, we are, we, anybody, people are powerless to really change our hearts from wanting to sin. From truly wanting and change it to truly wanting and doing what is right before God. People can learn to change behaviors and habits, but only God can change our insides, change our hearts. We can't follow the Lord at all in our own strength. Now, he's also an encouragement, though. Because one thing we see in his life is that God did help him. God helps his people. Sometimes God changes things. He can change situations and people. And he can bring success in ways that we would never have thought of. He is always with his people in hard circumstances and bringing us through those circumstances. God has power to help or to cast down. Something else that we can be encouraged from his life, and it may not sound like an encouragement at the beginning, 
But like Amaziah, we know we can be weak and we can be proud. But we can, what you can be encouraged by is that if we know that, we can also guard against it. We can put our trust in the Lord's strength and in his keeping of us that he will keep and hold on to us. Because God has power to help or to cast down. Now Amaziah, like I said, is a warning and an encouragement, which means he's an example to us. 1 Corinthians 10 talks about people and stories that we read in the Old Testament are there for the particular reason of being an example to us. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. We're the people that the end of the ages has come. It hasn't come yet, but it's coming a lot closer than the people in the Old Testament. But these things were written down as an example for our instruction. So what kind of example is Amaziah for us today? Well, verse 12 says it very clearly. Therefore, let anyone who thinks, thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. Now, you remember Amaziah. He thought quite a lot about himself, but... It wasn't warranted. He fell. And that fits. And we are not that unlike Amaziah either, are we? In that we can be weak and we can find sin to be appealing to us. But we need to be realistic about our weaknesses and know that we can only stand in God's strength. And that's why he says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Look back at those guys. They're really no different than us. So go to the Lord for help and strength. Now, verse 13, the next verse, is also a promise of God for his help in our temptations. Verse 13, some of you probably have memorized this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Whatever temptations you face, everyone else faces. God is faithful, and he will not let you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, that promise is not for when we're actively seeking to indulge in sin. That promise is for when followers of Jesus, when we are actively seeking to follow Jesus and temptations come. Because there always are temptations, as it says. But if we're seeking to follow the Lord, God can help us to not give in to that temptation. As he says there, there'll be a way of escape. He will provide that. But we can endure through the temptation and we can be faithful to follow Jesus because God has power to help or to cast down. Depend on him and he will help. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. (coughs) Even though it may not look initially like this guy is encouraging to look at Amaziah and his life and and how he just turned away from you. But your word is true, and it's there for us as an example and for our instruction, and we thank you for what you have instructed to us today. Father, whatever you have spoken to us about in our lives, help us, Father, to be obedient to you. Help us to be encouraged. Help us to be challenged. Just whatever, do your work in each one of our lives. Thank you so much for who you are that you are here for us. You are here for us all the time. You are here for us in our, in our temptations, in our struggles, in everything. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.